you for having me yeah great to have you so i wanted to ask you right here in terms of this whole wonderful news career that you had before we talk about um that uh, wonderful stuff that you're doing with daniel Lavazzi um right now and the praise that you had for him in regards to this just for those who don't know um your whole background of being at msnbc npr what made you uh want to get into the news uh, world and media world in general? Gosh, I coming out of college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I thought I'd either want to do news and journalism or law. And I um, took a right turn in a wrong turn and went into finance and discovered I didn't love that. It was, it was <laughs> the opposite of, of love. Um, I, uh, but during my commute, I discovered NPR at that point, and I fell in love with, with the way that public radio um, tells the news and tells stories and really crafts stories, and it felt like a complete, you know, more than often than not, a, a complete and thoughtful portrayal of what was out there and what's happening in the world, and um, really trying to um, uh, reach people through compelling storytelling, and I that, that's what gripped me and, and what I really wanted to, to do with my life. That's what I wanted to, to focus on. Was there any particular story or stories that made you turn into that direction of listening to NPR or just news in general that made you say, I really have a passion for this? Um, is there any stories that really put you into that direction? You know, there. I don't think there's any one particular story. I know that you know they talk about you know people have driveway moments, and I had you know multiple driveway moments. I'd get stuck in my car um, when I was supposed to either go into work or you know go you know get home, and and I'd want to finish listening to to whatever had been on. Um, you know, my first radio story that I did, I was completely hooked. I'd never. Uh, you know, recorded anything. I didn't study radio in college. It wasn't until after I was, you know, got my foot in the door at NPR in DC and went through the training program. Mm -hmm. um, the first story I did was about a homeless person living in Washington, DC on the streets. And as soon as I put those headphones on and had the microphone in my hand and his voice was beamed into my ears, it was with such clarity. Um, it was the power of the voice that really captures me. The human voice is really, um, every, everyone's voice is unique and uh, we're all unique. And, and, and it's really, it's a way of getting into your head and engages the imagination. Um, um, so I, I, was, I was hooked from the first news uh, radio story on. And by you being hooked on that first radio story on, um, what made for you that transition to wanting to then be in cable TV media with that? Because you know, I met you right when you were at MSNBC with that. So what led to that transition of then getting to the TV side of things? Well, I never had a desire to work in television news. I, I knew, um, you know, coming out of college, I thought I would probably end up in print if I did journalism. Um, then I discovered radio, uh, public radio, and fell in love with that. I had no desire to work in television. I never did, um, based on what I had seen, you know, on on the screen. It was really I had been working in radio. I worked in radio altogether for about twelve years, and the last two years I was a contributing producer to Alec Baldwin's podcast, um, which was done at a WNYC, the NPR station in New York. And I, I love that work. Um, I, I I really enjoyed working with Alec and. He then started a show at MSNBC. And it was, that's how I ended up working at MSNBC. He wanted me to help launch that program, which I did, but his show got canceled quickly after I had signed a lease and moved to New York. So I ended up kind of, I don't want to say I got stuck at MSNBC, but I kind of got stuck at MSNBC that way and um, tried to make the most of it after, after landing there. 
And we're not even gonna get involved to one of the notorious people that dealt with the problems, unfortunately, of that show, Don Larson. We're not even gonna get into that nonsense of how we had to deal, both of us, unfortunately, with him in different factors of the matter. And I said this publicly, so it's not a surprise to people that would say that. But for you, um, did you feel happiest with the Alec Baldwin show when you were doing it on radio? Was that the most happy you felt in regards to like your media career with that in terms of just the work that you were doing and the show that you were part of? You felt like the most fulfilled in that area? I, um, the work I did with Alec, on his podcast, probably yes. I mean, I did some work, at, I was working um, at the Bob Edwards show at the same time and I really loved the work I was able to do there. We had um, complete free, free reign and independence um, on that show. And I did some radio documentaries that I'm very proud of to this day um, there. That period of time in general, yes, was definitely um, a highlight for me. So it was a combination, I think of, of both. Alec and I um, had a close working relationship. And so that was that was a very positive experience for me. And we we were into the same types of stories and and the and um, we had the same approach um, to news stories and and the topics as well. So that was yes, for sure. That was a that was a highlight for me. And no doubt about it that um, you know, that propelled at least in terms of like the quality of work that you were doing at MSNBC despite all these nonsense that you had to deal with or stuff that you had to deal with that wasn't conducive towards uh, recreating that happy environment that you had when you did that um, show with Alec Baldwin in terms of on the radio stuff with that. You know, you, you had, it's about to be your two year anniversary away from MSNBC and you had that famous post that is still pinned um, to your Twitter page and I highly recommend those um, in the journalism world or getting into the journalism world with um, the post that you had in regards to it. And you had this uh, many great paragraphs in there, which you mentioning James Baldwin, when you had his famous quote, not everything is face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's face. You know, can you just talk about how that quote encapsulated how you felt uh, writing that piece and, you, you know, and, and just how you felt in regards to um, departing MSNBC? Yeah, I, I was at MSNBC for seven years, all total. And it took a few years for me to realize really what the problems were. I mean, obviously coming from public radio into commercial TV news, there, I, I realized that the rating system was gonna have an, an, an effect on, on my life and how editorial decisions were made. I didn't know the extent of it until after I'd been there for several years and was in those meetings um, with the executive and senior producers that really drives every single editorial decision. I mean, you, anytime you present an idea, it's pretty much the first thing out of their mouths in terms of that will rate or that won't rate. And I saw over time and I started documenting for myself um, really how bad it was on a daily basis. And so I then started reaching out to people saying, this is the problem. Do you think, do you think I'm, this is my, my take on the problem? Do you agree with me? And if so, what should I be doing? And I reached out to a wide range of people, people who I'd worked with before, um, new people. I reached out. I was looking for someplace else. To, where else do I go? Knowing what I know and knowing that I, I don't just want to go into another production job because this is a huge problem that needs to be addressed and I need to find a place where I can address it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, reached out to people who I knew had been working on this, had at least written about this problem, you know, for decades. It's not a new problem. It's just, and it's just, just gotten worse. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, that was the frustrating, <laughs> was kind of the frustrating point. And I, when I resigned, I said, I don't know where I'm going to go because there really wasn't any place for me to go. Um, there isn't anyone focused on the, the problems of financial incentives and TV news. And um, I think a lot that, that is due to a lot of apathy and there's a lot of cynicism, cynicism surrounding that topic. I think people have just kind of thrown their hands up in the air and said that there isn't anything that we can do. And so that that's what was behind the use of that quote, the James Baldwin quote, and um, saying we, you know, people aren't even trying to address this problem. I mean, there's so much attention on and the, like the misinformation and in and, and the digital world and what's happening online and there should be, but there's like so many people um, aren't focused on the role of TV news and cable news specifically. And that is, it, it's so influential. It's, it's, it's kind of bonkers to me that there is just no 
um, concerted effort on, on that front. And, you know, there, you know, it's a combination of, well, you can't regulate commercial entities and this is, you know, this is what the people want. There's that mentality. And I, that is, I'm still just can't, um, I can't accept that. I, in, in the United States of America, we should have the best new system in the world. Yep. And we don't. And, and, and for, for people just to throw up their hands and say, oh, that sucks, that there's nothing we can do about it. I can't accept that. And so that, that's, again, what was behind that. We, we need to address this. And I think that there is a desire to address that. But I, even in the two years since I left, I've been getting the same response from people as I reach out to whether it's um, other academics or former producers or people who um, may might still be currently in the industry. There's there's now I, I've discovered the extent of the um, uh, you know it's the um, media industrial complex. Um, you know, it, it, it extends beyond the TV news industry itself. There are so many other industries that rely on it um, and people have kind of come, you know, they're comfortable with the status quo. And so it, it, it's really hard to get people to, um, to, to, to budge off of that. And, and yeah. um, so I'm still there. I still think that, you know, nothing can be changed until, you know, we, we make an attempt to, to, to change it. Um, um, but it, it's a huge, huge task. I mean, that was a lot of like great courage for you to make that decision, you know, with that, because, you know, as we know, there are so many, you know, producers and, or, and other colleagues that in terms of the written side, you know, that feel the same way that you do with that and some friends that we know uh, with it, but it's something where, you know, they're still, you know, just wanting to still be at place or just finances or just the reasons of, you know, don't allow them to make that decision. You know, did you feel for you that was it because of just seeing the stuff happening during the pandemic and how coverage was in regards to it? Or did you feel that this was something before um, we had COVID-19, you know, really hit, you know, our shores that this was a thing that was fundamentally building for you for like a while with that? Yeah, I knew before COVID, before the pandemic, um, that it that it was a problem, and I was going to be leaving the industry. I and had kind of planned to resign in April 2020. Um, obviously, March 2020 <laughs> came, and the pandemic started. I thought, no, I can't, I can't quit in the middle of the pandemic. You know, um, who knows? You know what's going to happen to the economy, and that's a, that's a foolish move to make. Um, it took a month or two into the pandemic and then I realized I can't stay here. I absolutely, I don't care oh. what the financial consequences are. I can't stay here seeing what I'm seeing because it, it, they, you know, they started off doing what, what journalists should do. They covered the pandemic in earnest the way that professional journalists should, but it only took a couple of weeks before they realized, oh, it's not rating as well as a Donald Trump segment or we need to frame it a certain way you know, to, to, you know, how, you know, because that's what is rating. And so they, they started doing less of the science, less of the, the real issues. There was also, um, they, they were even comparing, you know, Donald Trump segments to George Floyd segments, you know, yeah. it got to that point. And, you know, the, my, you know, shows initial reaction, you know, the, 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 um, they asked our show to do a full hour on George Floyd a few days after his death. And, my executive producer's initial reaction was um, he recoiled at the thought of doing a full hour on George Floyd because, you know, there was all this Donald Trump material that he thought was going to rate better and he didn't want to, they weren't even, you know, they aren't, weren't, weren't willing to, to sacrifice, you know, 10,000 viewers or what, you know, you know, a very small per percentage of the overall audience at that point. And so seeing these decisions, I, I was just like, it, 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 in this, at this time, when, when our country is at, at, at arguably at its worst point and they still can't make proper editorial decisions, they'll never be able to make proper editorial decisions. And so that that's what spurred me to, to go ahead and make my decision to resign. That's the thing I just find so baffling with it because it's not like we see cable news, particularly in a non like election year, at least like at least in terms of national elections, um, regularly rate and ratings galore with that, you know, as we clearly see 
fixed propaganda, i.e. Fox News, as I call them, still dominate in terms of winning in the ratings with it. And it's something where to hear the likes of maybe like Andy Lack or those underneath him focus on that and put that on the producers that you work with and the staff that you work with is so bizarre because it's not leading to any rating still like in terms of growing like an audience with it. But yet they were so fixated on trying to retain those numbers instead of thinking that if we cover real issues that people will want to really be able to want to focus on news with that, that wasn't on their radar. What, what Was it more of them saying, using ratings and trying to say, oh, we don't want to make, say, Verizon upset if we cover net neutrality or in terms of any big pharma getting upset if we cover in regards to them always jacking up prices over drugs? Like, where was the basis of, of, of justifying ratings when the ratings just, weren't regularly there really like that right i mean they are so risk averse and their their idea of what rates well is is really kind of sad i mean you know uh i think that if you are providing the audience with new information in a you know compelling and interesting way they will keep watching because humans are inherently curious if you're if they're learning something that they don't already know they're going to continue to watch yeah. and um but they were they they were so afraid of that. They would look to see what rated well yesterday and try to replicate that. And so it's very backwards looking. You know, they 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 literally get the ratings every day at four p.m. They'd see what rated well in the first. You know, they, the numbers are broken down by quarter hour. They'd see what did well, what didn't do well, and they would adjust the current rundown based on that. And um, it it was a very frustrating endeavor because they would not listen to their own journalistic instincts and and that happened time and time again these stories would, would come up and i i present them the those ideas and i know that they are topics that, that my colleagues cared about and were interested in but they they would ignore their own instincts and their own interests to, to go with what the numbers were showing them but that it it made no sense i mean so it's it's just like bad decision making on top of bad decision making because also the numbers aren't you know, we know aren't accurate, you know, the ratings the Nielsen's ratings aren't accurate. So yeah. it, 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 it was very frustrating from, from start to finish. And, you know, something where you mentioned about um, this, you know, ratings exception, you know, there was a story, um, at least in terms of a few weeks ago, actually at the beginning of June, where, you know, CNN, they were so obsessive over putting the breaking news like tablet throughout, like, I mean, constantly, everything was like a breaking news. Even when news was six hours um, done, it was still getting the breaking news tab. And it was a decision where they finally decided rationally to stop doing that, you know, all the way. Unfortunately, though, it was from the guy that went and cut um, CNN Plus after they had launched that a whole month, only for him to come in for Discovery Plus and cut that all the way. Um, those levels of just, weird decisions being made and you you dealt again with andy lack in terms of nbc and the the bizarre decisions that he made how constant was that more than what the public you know would, would think would be the case it was it was every day i mean it would, and um you know i will say uh, a lot of the decisions especially early on to me felt arbitrary like I didn't understand what they were doing, and it wasn't again until I was in, in those editorial meetings that I that I under, came to understand how much the ratings drove those decisions. But then there were competing interests inside the building, and so um, someone like Andy Lack might, uh, you know, we got certain instructions from him that were very strange, and um, I think he had uh, I, I I can't speak for him, but they. The, his decision making was 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 very against the grain of a lot of other people in the, in the building, and so there was no cohesive mission. There was no cohesive understanding in terms of what we were supposed to be doing as a quote news organization. Can I ask you what was there one strange decision that you can remember, like specifically in terms of how bizarre that was that came maybe from him or around his people there that was really bizarre. Um, he, there were, a, uh, there were a couple, um, one that was pretty blatant to me, um, was, um, the Kavanaugh hearings, uh, uh when, um, 
the, the Senate, they were taking up the, the, the cap. There was that one day where um, Blasey Ford testified to the Senate about the alleged assault um, um, that she underwent. And it was a big news day. And that, that, you know, it was, you know, kind of all eyes on the Senate and on this potential um, Supreme Court justice, you know, what, what was going to happen. My host um, had been very good on that topic in general and had planned a show with, first of all, all women, um, legal scholars to respond and um, people who'd worked in the Senate on the Judiciary Committee. Um, we had, I thought it was a strong show lined up to cover, you know, what had, had happened that day. And um, our show ended up getting preempted. So uh, Andy Lack came in and scrapped our rundown and filled the show with, um, you know, it was all, I, I, not to denigrate NBC correspondents because they're great professionals at what they do, but they simply did not have the expertise that these other guests had. And he essentially dumbed down the, our coverage for that hour. And he specifically, you know, was micromanaging even the, the opening montage that we had. He had specific instructions on how to handle that opening montage. And, you know, don't, you know, basically don't be too hard and don't be too snarky against Kavanaugh. And that, oh. um, that was not the only time that sort of thing happened. Um, it happened during the 2016 election as well. Um, Kind of go easy on Trump, um, and that those were those were those were weird. Um, that was weird editorial guidance to get in general. We um, normally they didn't micromanage to that extent, but it was clear what was happening, and it was not based um, on good good journalism. Um, he may have his own take on it, and he may have his own. Uh, uh, reasons for saying and, and instructing what he did, but I can tell you, um, you know, just in, I, I, you know, based on my experience as a journalist, I, you know, worked in, you know, tw basically two decades as a journalist and um, those were not based in, on journalism. I mean, I, I don't know how you can take it easy on the guy who is, you know, um, directly being verbally abusive to war. It's like um, whether his fellow um, candidates or people with disabilities or, you know, in terms of people in terms of Latin America or in terms of then having access Hollywood tape of him, you know, willingly wanting to sexually assault women. Like, I, I, I just find that baffling. But then it's the same guy that decided to, um, instead of having Chairman Hall stay, gave Maggie Kelly a very problematic person in her time in Fox, a whole talk show that no one likes. Like, I, I, I just find how you were able to stay as sane as possible there, AP, like, you know, quite remarkable with that. And, you know, just how it seems with you making a decision, how much, you know, free a yard happy, not that you weren't at least a free independent person already to begin with, with that, but it's really seemed to be very beneficial for you when there's a lot of people that, again, wouldn't have had the courage to make that whole decision. So, you know, in this whole now going to be two year period of you um, leaving MSNBC, just, you know, how are you doing in general and, and how much to me, from my perspective, how much even happier you are with not having to deal with stuff like that? Well, um, I've not missed it for a single day, not for a single moment of a single day. Um, I definitely know I made the right decision. But at the same time, I know I basically wrote myself out of a career. Um, I, 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 you know, CNN is not going to hire me to come work for them, knowing what I feel about the industry. Um, and, and, and honestly, as we've seen, you're not missing anything with that. I mean, no, no, no. I, and I, I don't want to like, you know, I, and frankly, I, there's no, there aren't any commercial TV newsrooms that where I want to go work because I know that the, it, the problems are the same, you know, mm -hmm. network news looks different than cable, but the, the problems that, you know, I, I've talked to enough people. I know that they're also obsessed by the ratings. They can't get the stories on that they want to. You know, my friends who who work in these these newsrooms, it's not what I want to do. But I also know, like so that that is a closed door for me. You know, for for various reasons. Um, I'm still you know trying to figure out what to do two years later. Um, I'm still trying to to create you know a, a, a network of support. Um, 
a coalition of some sort to address TV news. And it, it's, it, it's, it's been, I've, I've made, had a little bit of success. Um, you know, I became a founding partner for this organization Starts With Us that was founded mm -hmm. by Daniel Lebetsky, which is a wonderful organization. And this is something that they have taken up as, as a topic, but it, it's hard to get, especially people inside the industry um, in any capacity to, um, to, 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 to put their guns behind this, this effort. And again, I think there's just so much cynicism um, and apathy related to it that it, it, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but um, it leaves me, you know, you know, trying to, 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 to battle this, you know, you know, largely on my own, which is, which is, is difficult. Well, I, I say first, um, with two more things to talk to you about, I say as someone that is fully emblematic of fighting that whole battle about this, and um, the thing that's given me comfort is seeing, at the very least, a lot of the online blogosphere, or progressive blogosphere, or, or, or at least you can say liberal blogosphere, in the period, um, at least towards the end of the Bush administration, where whether you know it was Daily Kos, the Media Matters, or Crooks and Liars, you know, as you obviously know with that, where that infrastructure was at least there, where it just wasn't like us, you know, seeing like, you know, there's a real problem in regards to a lot of false equivalents or a lot of like preference to just, you know, a lot of corporatism overall. And that at least there's an infrastructure people seeing the fundamental problems of um, cable news without being rabid right wingers who think that uh, Fox is betraying them and want to settle on OANN and Newsmax. Like, I, I think there's a lot of people that really feel that way. And I think even more you know, and with Twitter um, and, and Facebook, despite the issues of Facebook, but there's a lot of people on Twitter that really see the problems with, um, you know, big media or centrist media, as I call it, in terms of just corporate media with that, and are able to, like, align with you where, um, if, you know, whether um, status quo in terms of an example with that, or at least in regards to, you know, the websites that I mentioned with it, you know, I, I think there's a viable infrastructure with that, with stars with us, with you all, that, you know, really has people just see that they are really seeing the fundamental problems with, you know, legacy media in this country, and that they're still like a viable source of being a part of that group of being independent journalists that clearly are filling in the gaps that um, centrist corporate media isn't filling in. And, and do you feel like that way where it's not just say a lonely, you know, battle for, for you or Daniel with that? Um, those organizations, I think, are, are super important, and um, they certainly play a role. Uh, one of my things is it, it's not necessarily getting to the people who need to hear those messages. Um, there, are, you know, you've got the media critics uh, of the world that are doing great work, and um, it, it's a it's a tough role to take on to do that, um, especially in this environment where you're de dealing with um, you know, organizations that are not playing fair. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it very, very difficult. And, you know, so I, I know I, I've gotten, you know, I, I am public editor and I focused um, a great deal on CNN. And I know that there are people out there, why are you criticizing CNN when there's an organization that is worse than CNN? So, and and I, I understand all those issues. Personally, I'm not willing to lower the bar for CNN just because there's, right. no bar, there's not, a, there's a lower bar elsewhere. But I, I also understand the real world issues, you know, like if I, if they, somebody takes my opinion about CNN out of context to use it to, to, to defend, you know, you know, the Fox News of the world, you know, that, that is, that is a real issue. Um, but for me, the bigger picture is the, the wider American public. Not, none of that criticism really gets to the people who really need to see it. So that, you know, if there's, you know, criticism about Fox News, that's generally coming from someone and it's, it's the tone of it is, it's political and it's partisan, um, the, the criticism that's, that's coming out. Um, and that's one of the things I feel very strongly about and why I, and, and I think there's a reason for it to go at this um, from a structural perspective, not an ideological perspective. So my criticism is, is industry-wide. It's against MSNBC, CNN, and the Fox News of the world. Um, 
because in general, a lot of the criticism that's out there, and I think, you know, I, in my opinion, Fox News is the worst. Um, it, you know, it, it, they've spewed, they've repeated and lies about science and about the elections that are in, in, incredibly damaging to our democracy. Um, that criticism though, isn't getting to their viewers. Yeah. Because a lot of that criticism comes from people who probably seem like they're they're more liberal than conservative. And so it doesn't resonate with the audience. And you, even if it ends up in their newsfeed, they wouldn't believe it or, yeah. or take it to heart. And so um, there's that, but then also uh, there needs to be a source, uh, you know, the individual projects that, um, and the piecemeal, there are lots of great organizations that also doesn't get to the people who, who need it. So the, you know, the general audiences out there, they don't know how to find the smaller organizations. And, and if they do, can they trust them? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think about members of my own family, they would have no idea what, you know, ProPublica is, yeah. or whether they could trust it. Um, you know, there are lots of, you know, organizations and outlets that are highly, um, um, it's high quality, it's worthwhile information, but they have A, have no idea how to find it or B, to trust it. And so I feel like there needs to be a network of some sort that has some name recognition that people understand and trust. Um, I still feel like there is that that is something that is essential um, to really addressing the, the, the problems and, and informing the, the, the public at large. Um, There's some people who are automatically politically engaged and um, that is not my, uh, what I think we should be focused on. I think we need to be focused on, on the wider public and yeah. trying to engage the wider public because, um, and I think a lot of people aren't tuned in because they don't like the options that are out there that they see. Um, and I think that, that like, you know, a lot of people know that cable news sucks they know that it's not quality information for the most part. And yeah. so the, why bother watching it? But that, that, that's like, most people prefer to watch their news versus reading it. You know, if for no other reason, it's a, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to properly read in every day. You know, I can easily spend five or six hours every morning reading the news to figure out really what, what's going on and what's important. Most people don't have that time. And so there needs to be some source that people can go to any time of day, whether it's online or you know a, a, a streaming service of some sort that they they know is is reliable, and um, that does not currently exist. Yeah, uh, you said that exactly right on that, um, AB. No question about that. And um, you know something where particularly having like a sister and brother in law who you know really you know you know really smart people, but just don't like to watch like in terms of dealing with the ridiculousness of news and then just the, you know, a lot of negativity with that. That's the thing that echoes, you know, for a lot of people who are aware, but they just don't have time to really dwell into how fundamentally a problem this is, you know. You know, one thing for me, like to close on this, that, you know, I say, you know, what I do is in regards to, you know, some colleagues on, um, you know, these legacy media outlets is that sometimes when it's a thing that clearly is a problematic um, journalism practice that they would do, for example, have on a lot of these um, people from the, as I call him, the disaster and tweet administration and have those in terms of Donald Trump and have them with these book tours. And as we've seen with a lot, I mean, oh, you, you go, you go right ahead. I mean, Alyssa Farrow, see her constantly. has just been like, Beyond bonkers. <laughs> I mean, you, you yep. go right. Yeah. <laughs> Kellyanne Conway published a book and people like welcomed her in their newsrooms. Like, like she had never, like, like they had amnesia or something. They hate, like, they, they completely forgot all the times that she lied and admitted that she lied and, and just, she was selling a book. It, it, like that, that there is like zero journalism involved in that. It's her, you know, hawking her story that she wanted to, to tell, and they they treated it like this is a, a legitimate, you know, news source, um, newsmaker, and um, that is that happens all. I mean, that that's you know, 
not the most recent example, but it's, you know, a blatant example. And, you know, all of these people, you know, had, you know, when, um, you know, and that is a, a huge point of frustration when um, uh, McCarthy, who was hired by CBS, um, you know, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a news contributor. Mick Mulvaney was? Mick Mulvaney, like, that's, yep. that's Mick Mulvaney. He, yep. uh, again, like CBS News, a legitimate, quote, legitimate news organization hired him knowing what his role was and what, what you know, how he defended um, lies while he was chief of staff. Um, and, 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 you know, in earlier iterations, you know, working for that administration, it's, it's bonkers to me that that is that there are there was a legitimate quote legitimate news organization that said okay that 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 makes sense to bring him in on our staff. Um, your and you know, they they they'll bring in John Bolton as uh, I, I you know in, during the Ukraine crisis he was on MSNBC and CNN as a legitimate you know in, in analyst and we. <laughs> How we know that these people lied. As soon as someone lies, that means that they're not a reliable guest anymore. Because how do you, how can you trust what they say going forward? And and that is such a fundamental problem. But again, it's part of this uh, media and industrial media complex. They, yeah. you know, the the publishers, you know, are making money. The there are other news outlets, the print outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they're making money off of this coverage. Um, and so they all end up supporting that, you know, the, those editorial practices and are, they're okay with the status quo. And, but, but it is a major, major problem. Yeah, seeing Stephanie Grisham on uh, with Erin Brunette, I mean, and, and considering like her CNBC days, not surprising, but still how problematic that was. I mean, it's one thing for them to be on the Bird Eye Fix Propaganda Fox News channel, but to see them be on, you know, centrist media and those outlets, I mean, it's just something where the lack of accountability is just so baffling and unfortunately fundamentally part of our, you know, nation's like flaws. Um, but, you know, a thing that I do is that I, I really directly, you know, tell these people directly on Twitter, like, hey, like, this is clearly like a whole problem with this. like just individually, you know, tagging them. And sometimes, and I remember one time with Jake Taper, I got into it with him over just how, it was over Asada Shakur and this whole thing of him just trying to, once again, believe and hold just cop testimonies and things like that without just saying to himself the biases that he already was, you know, wanting to just fully be all in. And I, I think that's a, an effective thing, at least in terms of that, even if some people obviously may not like it, but it's something where it's a fundamental problem when we see um, colleagues in these prominent places where you already had those platforms still do that and lead to the public distrust being so bad with, with news in general. Yeah, and it, it, the thing is, if you see John Bolton on Andrea Mitchell's show, you're gonna think, oh, Andrea Mitchell trusts him, so I can trust him. Yes. And that, that's exactly what happens. But I also know the decision-making process Andrea Mitchell probably wasn't the one who decided to put him on. She agreed to it, but th there's a this process. We need someone who people recognize, someone who's going to rate well. And John Bolton, you know, is, you know, is a recognizable figure, and people will probably tune in to hear what he has to say, whether they agree with him or not, whether it's like to hate watch or to uh, go, you know, listen to what he legitimately has to say. And so. And again, it, it, it's about keeping the audience. And so, you know, making those editorial decisions based on um, an incentive structure that that encourages those types of decisions is is terribly damaging for the country. Um, so it, 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 that's that's what I keep coming back to. Well, someone who's certainly not damaging to the country and at least being one of the same people and courageous people, which you can't unfortunately say with a lot in American legacy centrist media uh, with that one area of market. Give her a round of applause once again, y'all, because she's been such a this whole entire
where it is the weight of the man, it is the weight of our decisions that we make. And some people make great decisions like her, and hopefully more by this time we just feel just that. That's just for another edition of overall always on weekend shows here on the Geek Network. Take care and stay well. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.